<laughs> he, he lives in Tasmania. <laughs> and um, <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, about two years ago, we went on the road for uh, a year and a bit. A whole year and a bit. Can you believe that? Wow. And then just recently, we were gone six months. And, uh, and I was asleep one night, and I woke up, and I thought, what's going on here? And the Spirit of God said, go back to Arizona, do it this Thursday. This was on a Tuesday. And I said, well, that's only just two days away. He said, go back home. So I said to my wife, uh, now, all, we had all these churches lined up, and we could have stopped up there for another 12 months, who knows? And uh, so I said, we've got to go back home. So we packed up and come back home, and, and we were home for about a week and a half, and then the virus came. Yeah. And, uh, and so all those churches up there closed down anyway. God knew, huh? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so it just kaput. And um, Amen. what had happened, I had a pastor called Bob, we had 17 different churches in Sydney, Australia. My wife has been to Sydney five times in the last eight years or something. And uh, we had uh, four, well, four of those churches belonged to one pastor. His number one church was nearly 400, and then he had a couple of smaller churches. And he called me up on Facebook, and he, and he said, when are you coming back to Sydney? And um, and I said, uh, just give me a little moment, I'm going to pray about it, and I'll get back with you. He said, okay. He said, we want you to come as soon as you can. So this is after we came back home from up there in the west, uh -huh. uh, Portland and Oregon, you know. And, uh, and I said, I'll get back with you. And then about two or three days later, I had another pastor, has four churches out in California, associated with that black church. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. he knows what he's talking yeah. about. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, when are you going to come and preach for us and I'm going to set some meetings up? I said, great. And then uh, there was this Hispanic pastor in Mesa. They run about 700. He said, we're going to get you to do a revival. Praise God. And then another Amen. church got in contact with me. Hallelujah. And I said to my wife, I said, well, God really sent us home because things are going to move now. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> And then about two weeks, well, it was, it was only about a week later, yeah. all the virus. And so all of those ministries, and so for the last four and a half months, our ministry has been shut down. Hadn't preached nowhere in four and a half months. Wow. Not because I, all because of the stupid Chinese virus. <laughs> Amen. Oh, Praise God. Amen. Um, Hallelujah. You know, you have to trust the Lord, <laughs> don't you? Amen. Amen. Good to see you again. <laughs> you too. Amen. Been a couple you of too. Years. I've been the Lord. out there doing stuff. and You're always coming back, though. <laughs> come back. Amen. It's good and, to see uh, you. Praise love the you, brother. Lord. And Amen. May the Lord bless you and watch over you. Amen. You want to say hi to everybody? Yes. <laughs> nice to be back again. It's wonderful. Amen. Yes. Good uh, to all these people. Um, you're, I'm proud. I'm sure you're very proud. <laughs> no, I'm very humble, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, so it's good. so good to see you. Amen. Yeah. They come back a long ways. That's right. Yeah. The Lord just bless this couple in Jesus' name. We pray, Father, for the glory of the Lord to be upon them. And that, Lord God, that you would just go before them, God, and make ways that they're just as you said today through our brother, that you're making ways in ministry, God, because, God, you've got much more work to do for them because the harvest is great, but the labors are few. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. we we'll have to come and have you come. You're going to be sticking around long enough to come back and preach for us. Amen. Praise the Lord. He's, yeah. Sure. Wanna, yeah, go ahead. I just... The Lord is saying to you, you have no idea what is yet to come. I show you many things, but you have no idea Amen. what is yet to come and who and what <coughs> will happen as I send you out. Amen. 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 All right. <laughs> Welcome to the prophetic church. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, um, uh, I've been just spending my time praying, waiting on the Lord, 
Amen. And praying for hours every day, you know, just walking around quietly praying. And I say, Lord, I got nothing else to do but pray. Hallelujah. Not that that's a bad thing, it's a good thing. Right? <laughs> that's right. Just quietly praying in the Holy Ghost, hours every day, just pressing in, pressing in. And uh, early this morning, if you don't mind me saying this, early this morning, yeah. the Lord said, You got no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> and I said, Oh, okay. Amen. And, Confirmation. Uh, yeah. God's confirming it. Yeah. Uh, God is going to open up the nations to war. Amen. I was going to sit down. I know you had something. Yeah. The Lord yeah. says He's going to open up the nations to you. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And, uh, Amen. I receive that. It has opened. I want it to open more, 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 more. Yeah, but it's going to open up a lot, a lot of things Good. for you. Good. Good. And uh, God is going to do some great things. You know. Uh, this stupid virus business <laughs> and um, <laughs> can I just say this yeah. in Psalms 100 and, uh, sorry Psalms 91 uh, Amen. verse 1 to 10 and, yeah. and it says uh, you know those who put their self under the tabernacle of God mm -hmm. those who come under the wings of the tabernacle of God Amen. you know are, are protected yeah are protected in verse 10 says and no, uh, what does it say? Well, we call it virus. Right, right. Yeah, no virus will come. No. Yeah, it uses another word. Well, Trump calls it a plague, you know. Yeah, so. plague. Well, no. Well, actually, I think That's it right. calls it a plague, too. Yeah. Uh, verse, uh, right. Psalms 91, verse 10. Right. No plague no will come near your dwelling. No plague shall come near your tent. Amen. We are, and the Lord keeps telling me, you know, your mind. Let me just get, exhort you for a moment. Your mind and my mind are carnal minds. Right. They belong to this world. Our minds belong to this world. That's why we have to renew our minds. Yes. Amen. And sometimes that takes time. You have to work on it and you pray in the Holy Ghost. I encourage you, pray in the Holy Ghost all the time because Amen. the word Amen. and praying and work and praying, you build yourself up Amen. and gradually you can overcome that fear. And uh, it takes time, but you have to work at it. Amen. Amen. And, and no plague shall come near your Amen. tent. They shall fall to the left, they shall fall to the right, but it shan't come under you. Amen. Why? Why? Because you have made the Lord your God your tabernacle. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Everybody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. I've received that. We all receive that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Yes. Amen. You know, the word um, presence in the Bible is... Uh, the word where we get the word tabernacle from and we were I was telling my wife this morning there's so many discoveries out of the Word of God um, that we find and that's why we need to study Amen. we need to study and dig how many's got a shovel Amen. we need to dig into the Word of God because I don't know if you knew this but it's something I just found out as I was studying that the word the Shekinah we're talking about some of the Shekinah glory Shekinah is not a, is not in the Bible the word in the Hebrew, Shekinah, was a, was a phrase in the Hebrew that was coined or created by the rabbis. How many did not know that? Yeah, the word Shekinah is not in the biblical text anywhere. But it comes from the word that means to tabernacle. And so um, the word dwelling place is the same word like to, to have a tabernacle of God or a dwelling place of God. And that's, that's just what Dan just said. He that, in Psalms 91.1, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that dwells, that word dwell means like to create a tabernacle. So, anyways, just give you some information whether you ask for it or not. You, you got it. But there's things like that. You know another thing I found out? Was that there was no rope on the high priest's ankle. That was another thing the rabbis in the Talmud had created. There was, in the Bible, you won't find it anywhere where there was a rope that with the high priest dies. I think that was just biblical. You know, where the, they, if he did something wrong in the Holy of Holies, they would have to pull him out. And by the way, he didn't wear bells in the Holy of Holies. The bells were only on his gown or his skirt when he was in the, the second place. There's the, the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. When he was in the inner court, which they call the holy place, that's when the bells were on him. How many did not know that? They said, as long as you hear those bells, he's alive. I used to hear that all the time. I guess it's, it's a Pentecostal thing, right? I don't know. But it's actually not true. So I like to know the truth. And I'm not against Shekinah. If you want to use that word, I like to Shekinah glory. 
you know, but it's actually um, another word, shadon. Shad, yeah, shadon, and, it, and it's similar, but it's not the same word. So anyways, I want to be technically correct. I don't want to teach something that's not true. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Remember our services Wednesday at 6 o'clock, and we're having prayer at 5, and it's been growing. It's been Amen. getting gooder and gooder. Yeah. It's getting better all the time. And we had a wonderful Wednesday night time, even prophetic time afterwards, and activating everybody in the prophetic. You know, God wants to activate you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I want to be a facilitator and an activator. Amen. I want, to, I want to activate you and help facilitate what God is doing in the spirit because we're a many-membered body. Amen. Amen. So God's got to heal us of all of our dysfunction Amen. so we can function. Amen. Amen. He was asking the question. Sister was asking, you know, where do I need healing? God says, I'm healing you. But there's things we don't even know about that we're still being healed from. God's still working on us. And, you know, it doesn't mean like we need like a, like a real deep deliverance. But, you know, sometimes we don't realize how much deep, deep we need that deliverance. Amen. There's things we can't see. It's true. It's the truth. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Go with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 13. And if you got a, a healing in any of our services re recently, if you got healed by a miracle, let us know. We want to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. People are being healed all the time. And we believe in healing. We believe that it's, it's part of the church's responsibility. It's part of the shepherd's responsibility. A shepherd is a pastor. is to bring healing to the sheep. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everybody say, bah. No. <laughs> so we can, all be, we can all be healed. We can all be made whole Amen. in every area of our life. And like I was telling our sister this morning, we're always being healed. We're not, God's still making us whole. There's Amen. still areas of, of our lives that we don't even realize in our mind, in our emotions. Come on in our physical body, in our being. There, there might be, sometimes I've called out healings. There were people, I'm praying over them, and I see something, and they say, well, I don't know if that's wrong with me or not. And I, I didn't think, you know, I know God showed me. I'm not saying I'm perfect at hearing, but, you know, and I knew it was God. And later on, they go, yeah, you know, I went to the doctor. He said something. God's healing me of that now. Amen. Amen. So you never know. Amen. Hallelujah. We've had people say, well, when you told me to take a deep breath, and I did after that, I had better capacity to breathe. See, God knows us better than we know ourselves. Amen. And we don't have to know everything. Amen. Some people ask me before, how do you start prophesying like that? How do you prophesy like that? It's not like, you know, when I first went to Sweetwater Church, they asked me that because I was prophesying almost every week. Because the pastor Foster would put a, a microphone on this side, a microphone on that side. And between songs, he'd let you get up and prophesy. Remember that? And, uh, you know, I start prophesying a lot there. But the way it works is you just step out and God keeps giving you more. He don't give you... He don't give you the whole script. Yeah. Amen. It doesn't work like that. He, he's looking for yielded vessels. Amen. Come on. God wants us to be surrendered and yielded and ready for what he wants to do. God wants to prepare us for greater things. Amen. Amen. How many know the best is yet to come? Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. The best is yet to come. Hallelujah. And uh, I'm actually on part three of Give Me Back My Church. And uh, we are live streaming today, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. We're live streaming. And also we're, we're going on YouTube. And our brother is doing such a great job saying thank you so much. Amen. And um, all the, everybody that's working together to help us do that. We appreciate, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. Right. And we're all working together. And we really are getting a, a bigger audience now that's been really tuning in and watching. Amen. And one, one sister told me, she said last week, she said, there's some people watching you and they go, hey, there's, there's something happening over at that Miracle Life Church. Yeah. And they don't even go to our church. Yeah. That really encouraged me. Mm -hmm. They said, there's really something happening over there. Have you heard that pastor over there? And there's a move of God taking place. I, I'll tell you, the word is getting out. Yeah. That God is moving. God is working. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we're, we're in a church where we tell people to take off your mask. Amen. Amen. Your spiritual mask. Someone's going to say, oh, no. No, if you want to wear, wear, wear a mask today, that's fine. Amen. We want social distancing if you need to. Praise the Lord. Amen. But we're sanitized and we're sanctified. That's right. Amen. And we're going to be glorified Hallelujah. by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We just pray again, Lord, for the power of the Spirit to come. Heal every person here, Lord, today. You delight. You take pleasure in healing. 
your people, God. You have more delight and pleasure and desire than we do. You want to dance, you want to sing, you want to yes. jump, you want to shout when you see your children being healed by your power. Yes. And we just pray today, Lord, for that understanding so we can receive from you. Just say, Lord, I receive everything you have for me right now. From the top of my head to the soles of my little feet. <laughs> little feet. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. So you can tune in or um, you can type in either Miracle Life Church or Pastor Patrick Massaro on um, YouTube and then you, it's easy, isn't it? Yep. Facebook.com if you want to do live stream and then just search for Miracle Life Church. How many sometimes watch it again? Mm -hmm. Amen. I even watched it again, praise God. <laughs> Amen, because it's God's word. And you know, I really feel like our church is in a, in a place of growth and there's such a, a momentum in the spirit that I'm sensing here Amen. that God is doing. And so we want you to join in and be part of it. And we want everyone to be filled with the Spirit. Amen. You know, we have a, a brother, Brian Fleming, is going to be coming. Pastor Brian Fleming is going to bring his group at the end of the month as well, again, to join us. I remember Big Brian. He's coming. And uh, I've asked Ron Perry to see if he can make it that day too. Pastor Ron Perry. And we had a nice talk on the phone yesterday and just talking about the moves of God. You know, he's been a part of so many moves of God, Ron Perry has. He's such a witness. And I said, we need to hear from you. Amen. I mean, he's seen the ball of fire come into the midst. He saw flames of fire come on people's heads. Yeah, not, not just reading about it. How many want to see it in action? Amen. How many know the flames of fire never went back, never went back up to heaven? Amen. <laughs> Amen. When that rushing mighty wind came down, it never went back up. The Bible never says it went back up. That means it's still here. Hallelujah. Amen. Turn and tell somebody it's still here. That rushing mighty wind is still here. God is still moving by His Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the greatest thing that we could experience today is to be filled with the Holy Ghost all over again. I'm telling you. Is to be filled with the power of God. I'm, a, I'm just a Pentecostal boy, you know. I really am. I come from that kind of background. I remember... I was in church, and you walk in Pastor Mobley's church over in Highland Park, California, right next to Eagle Rock. How many know where that is? Anybody know? And I'll tell you, you, you kind of, I hope it's this way here. This is my prayer. When you walked into his church and you sat down, in five minutes you can feel something. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> you start feeling the Spirit of God. You didn't have to do anything. You're just breathing. You're just sitting there. The service didn't even start yet. And you start feeling something a-creeping. Something coming on you. The creep is not a good word, right? But something just coming, something just coming on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, I couldn't wait to get to church. I couldn't wait to experience the presence of God. I, I experienced it when I was seven years old in that church. Actually, when I was four, because something hit me. And I was four years old, and it was the Spirit of God. I didn't know it then, but something hit me, and I started running down the church aisle so fast. Something hit me, and I ran. I felt so happy and so joyful, and I remember my mom chasing after me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. And I experienced it. I went back to that same church when I was seven years old, and I remember I felt that same feeling again. <laughs> and I said, that's the same thing I felt when I was a little boy. And I'm still a little boy, seven years old. And I said, this is the presence of God. Amen. And I went back again, amen, when I was 15 and 16. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, and I grew in that church. Amen. And that's what I want for each one of us is to be filled with the Holy Spirit, amen. to feel his presence. To tell you, once you have an encounter with God, you can never be the same again. Amen. It's not enough just to hear good preaching. I mean, good preaching is important, but we need to experience the power. Amen. We need to see that demonstration of God's power in action. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. 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 So I'm going to talk about three things today out of 1 Chronicles chapter 13. I'm going to talk about, number one, the birth, the birth of the vision. Number two, the death of the vision. And number three, the resurrection of the vision. Okay? Hallelujah. So there'll be no division, praise God. Those three things. And uh, we talked about this last week, but just going back over it, when you see from verses 1, chapter 13 of Chronicles, all the way through to verse 8, we see that David 
in verse 1, consulted with the captains and thousands and hundreds and with every leader. So he was the visionary. David had the vision to bring back the glory of God. Amen? Amen. He had it because he had that desire. And that glory, remember that glory means to see the actual presence of God in action. To see a move of God. A lot of people talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But it's another thing to actually experience the moving of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we need. Amen. And that's what David was talking about. He wanted the Ark of the Covenant to be returned that had been taken away during the days of Saul. And as we read on here, David, he shared that vision with all the leaders and then with all the people. First, it comes to the leadership, comes from the top down, and then it came to everybody. When we read this, we can see it so clearly. In verse 1, it says that he talked with every leader. In verse 2, and David said unto the congregation of Israel, if it seems good unto you, and if it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere. Now we're going to spread this vision everywhere. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We want this vision to be everywhere. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And with them that are left in Israel, and, and them that are the priests and Levites, which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. Why is this gathering taking place? It's right there in verse 3. And let us bring again the ark of our God to us. Hallelujah. Wow. That's the whole reason. That's the whole purpose. Because we know that this ark actually had the manifested presence of God's glory being seen, being felt. Amen. Amen. And that's the reason why the ark was the only furniture that was in the Holy of Holies. Yes. You know that. The only furniture that was in the Holy of Holies, amen, it's noisy back there, was, was the ark, amen? Hallelujah. And you know, the high priest can only go in once a year. Once a year was that holy. And only the high priest can go behind the veil. How many know there was, there was a veil there? Amen. The veil that, that was actually separating man from God, from a holy God. And that high priest could go on once a year to bring atonement. It's called the atonement for the people. And he had to have blood from a slain animal. He could not go on his own merit. He could not go on his own deeds. Amen? Yeah. He had to go through the substitutionary death of another. And the Bible says in Hebrews 10 that Jesus entered into the Holy of Holies, the true Holy of Holies for us. And that he offered his own blood once and for all. Amen? So that we can receive eternal redemption, the Bible says. And that we can receive that atonement, that covering, that forgiveness of our sins. Can you say amen? amen. And that's what it's about. And this ark, literally, the Bible says that he was enthroned. God was enthroned upon the top of the ark. It says he was enthroned there. And now the Bible says that God's enthroned upon our praises. Amen. David began to see the revelation of that ark of the covenant. And he says, I want to bring it back. Let's all gather together. It's going to take a team effort to bring the glory of God back into his house again. Yes. How many want to see his glory? Yes. I'm telling you, this is actually a latter rain teaching. Yes. The latter rain movement of 1948 began to teach this truth. It's not because I'm copying it or anything like that. This is what God showed me. I found out later on it was a latter rain teaching Amen. about restoring the presence of God about coming back, amen, to that place where we're moving in the book of Acts all over again. How many want to see the book of Acts? Yes. The Acts of the Holy Spirit. The actions of the Holy Spirit. That's what it's about. Amen. <laughs> that's what it's about. Amen. I'll tell you, that's what this nation needs. Amen. That's what this country needs. Amen. That's what our government needs. Our federal, state, local government, it needs to see the acts of the Holy Spirit. We need it more than ever. Hallelujah. It's getting hot in here. Maybe it's just me. Is it me? <laughs> Maybe it's that tongue of fire. I don't know about you, but I'm getting hungry. I want more. I said I want more. I want more. I want to go to the nations because I want more of him. I don't just go and go on vacation. Amen. Even when we went together, we didn't even hardly see anything over there but Jesus. 
I tell you, it's not about, sure, it's nice to see some scenic areas and things like that and landmarks and famous places, yeah. but you know what it's all about? Seeing Jesus yeah. moving. Hallelujah. You know what I'm talking about. Yes. Hallelujah. You all need to go somewhere and see Jesus move in other places Amen. besides your own Amen. little world. We need to get out of our bubble. We need to get out of our little places yes. and, and yes. say, God, what are you doing over there? Amen. Right. Hallelujah. 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 Tell you, some of you had to travel a long ways today, and we appreciate that because God's going to bless you for it. Amen. We had a lady years ago saw me on TBN, and she came on a Wednesday night just because she needed prayer all the way from Tucson. Yes. And I said, well, you're going to stay with some relatives at the end of the service? I asked her that. She said, no, I'm going back to Tucson. <laughs> wow. I'm like, man, I said, I'm ready to pray for you now. Because <laughs> I knew that she would have God's answer because God always answers active faith. Yes. When we do something, I used to actually have a little ministry up in Wickenburg before I started the church here. And it was, didn't make sense to me because people from Scottsdale were going all the way up to Wickenburg and Phoenix were going all the way up to Wickenburg. And I thought, why didn't you just, Lord, why didn't you just, have you ever asked God questions? Why didn't you just have me down here doing a ministry? You know, he said, because I want to see effort. God blesses effort. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And when you make one step for Jesus, he's going to make 10 steps towards you. He makes more of an effort than we do. And he's going to bless you. He loves sacrifice. How many found out God loves sacrifice? Even when I, when I was part of a music team years ago, and all the practice we did. In fact, Carlotta was actually part of that team. I don't know if you remember back in the day at Sweetwater, and she was one of the praise singers, amen. <laughs> and you know, we would practice and practice, and the more you practice, the more you wanna do an excellent job for God, the more he blesses you. Amen. When it's time, when it's time to minister, there's even a greater anointing. How many found that out? Yeah. Everything you do for Jesus, yeah. he sees every little thing, even if you're sweeping the front of the church, yeah. there's an anointing on that broom, hallelujah. Yeah. Sweeping all them bugs away. Praise God. How many of you to get all the bugs out? Amen. Praise God. Amen. So David said, let's bring that ark back. We need to bring that glory of God because we did not inquire of it in the days of Saul. We didn't seek after the Lord. We didn't have that desire, and that hunger because we were under wrong leadership. Come on, God wants us to be under the right leadership so we'll get hungry for God and for the things of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God wants to heal our marriages. God wants to heal our families. God wants to heal our finances. God wants to heal our cities. God wants to heal everybody. But he can only do it when we get in touch with the healer. Amen. Amen. Jesus came to give us life in abundance. Your best life now is with Jesus. It's with Jesus. And the more we understand that, the more we're going to see his power because he hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same Jesus. There's not another Jesus. Come on, somebody. Help me with that. Say amen. amen. He's the same son of God. And his glory wants to come back to his house. It's not normal not to see miracles. It's normal to have miracles in every church service. That's normal. Let's find out what God's norm is. Because it's not what we think it is. Some people think going to church is going there, hearing something, going to leave. Let me go now. Don't get too excited. Don't scare anybody. Hey, we want to scare the devil out of you. <laughs> Amen. Now, I just want to be a yielded vessel. That's all it is. Amen. Anyways, moving along here. <laughs> so we didn't inquire. That inquire word, inquire, remember, it means to seek after. We didn't actually go and try to find out where is this ark. They, they were forgetting about the glory. Can you imagine? My heart is so burdened. Because there's so much God wants to do. There's so much He wants to demonstrate and show forth His power and glory. And yet there's so little hunger and desire for it. And people are turning to nothing but psychology and calling it preaching. Come on, somebody. I feel like, I feel like God wants to slap some people. You might give a good teaching, man, and you got to have some fizz there in that soda pop. We need to have the anointing of God, I tell you. Without the anointing, we don't have anything. 
Amen. You can say you can say the scriptures and everything, but without the anointing on it, it doesn't do anything because it's the anointing that destroys the yoke and lifts the burden. I tell you what, the early church, the first century Christians, the first Christians, they knew they had to be filled with the Holy Spirit before they did anything. You don't even hear that anymore in this charismatic movement. I don't know if they still call it that or not. I'll tell you, but this is, this is a picture of the current move here because David had the vision. He got the vision, he imparted that vision, and then it became everybody's vision, it became the leader's vision. That's how it works. God will raise up a prophetic voice. Amen. For every generation, for every move of God, there's a prophecy behind that move. God will always prophesy what he's about to do. Amen. That he shows his servants, the prophets, and then God begins to reveal it to the leaders. And then the leaders begin to impart it to the congregation. And we can see that as well in verse four. And all the congregation said that they would do so. Amen. Everybody wanted to get involved. Everybody wanted to be part of it. For the thing was right in the eyes of the people. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established to be from God. That's called the church. That's called body life. God brings the witnesses together so that we can say, this is from God. Amen. This is what God wants to do. And another person says, amen. Because we all have the witness of the Holy Spirit. In David, verse 5, David gathered all Israel together. And they all came together, amen, from Shai, from the north to the south is what that means, to bring the ark of God from Ker Jath Jerem. That's where it was all for 20 years. Yeah. Amen. After the Philistines had taken it captive, they gave it back because they couldn't handle that holy ark of the covenant. It was destroying their land and they brought it back, amen. Yeah. But they didn't bring it back where it belonged. But it's so interesting because David didn't put it in Moses' tabernacle. He created a tabernacle called the Tabernacle of David. Amen? Amen? And then we want to talk more about that because the tabernacle of David is our praise and our worship. Amen. That's where we develop a habitation for God to come in Amen. and dwell. It's called yeah. the tabernacle of David. Say the tabernacle of David. Tabernacle of David. Amen. Amen. And then the Bible says, you know, in verse 6, I want you to see that David went up and all Israel. Let me say all Israel. Amen. Everybody was together to Bala, that is to Kirjath Jerem, which belongs to Judah, which means praise, to bring up thence the ark of God, the Lord, which is Yahweh there, capital L-O-R-D. Amen. That dwells between the cherubims. It didn't say it didn't say anything else, but the fact that God actually in reality was dwelling above the cherubims, the two the two angel statues above that were on the mercy seat. It says who dwells. Amen. Between the cherubims whose name is called on it. How many of that's a holy thing? Yes. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab. Father of generosity, that means. And Uzzah means strength. And Ahio means brotherly love. So they had it all together. The brothers, they had that brotherly love. They had the networking going. They had everybody all together on this thing. Sounds just like a charismatic church to me. Amen. And they're all going together bringing this new thing, they were doing a new thing. They said, we got a new, we got a new, we got a new third wave coming. You're hearing always is people trying to reinvent the wheel, trying to reinvent the move of God. I tell you, I was so hungry for God. I tried to find out what this all was all about with people shaking and baking and doing all these things. And I'm like, you know, I was like, man, I'll shake and bake if it gives, gives me more of Jesus. I don't care if you know what I'm talking about. And they're talking about these different things. Oh, the third wave, we're in the third heavens now, and all this is happening. And I'm thinking, what? And I try to jump in on that move. You know what? I'll tell you what. It's always been the same move. It hasn't changed. Amen. It's still about Jesus. It hasn't changed. It's always going to be about Jesus. Yes. All about Jesus. That's right. That's right. That's right. Amen. And in fact, we got to go back to the way it was in some places. Hey, the move of God that Ron Perry talks about. Right. We haven't seen that here. You know, Sister um, Beal, Mom Beal, they called her, out of Detroit. She said that they had, when the move of God hit their church in Detroit, it was one of the biggest Pentecostal churches in the United States. And she said that they had church every single day and night for three and a half years. And she said, Lord, I'm getting kind of tired. I'm getting kind of tired after three and a half years. But don't you think that's miraculous? Have you ever heard of that? And when I talked to Ron Perry, he said, oh, my dad, Nate Perry, he was a very famous man of God. He said, we did it for five years. Every single day and every single night, God was moving by his spirit here in the United States of America. 
You never hear that happening. And if it is happening, I want to find out. We'll go over there, praise God. I'd like to do it here if you let me. Amen. We'll see what God wants to do. We want to be led by the Spirit. If He lets me, if He lets me, you, you have to let me. <laughs> but we'll see what He wants to do. Amen? Amen? I thought, you know, it was just revival for a couple months. Oh, no, it was three and a half years. No wonder God moved. People from all over the world were coming. Coming for the presence of God. He was telling me yesterday that people would sit down and hear the heavenly choir. A thousand people would sit down and listen. There were thousands of people, actually. He said there was like 1,500, 2,000 people. You couldn't even fit them in the church. Some people are standing. Wow. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm getting stirred up. Because God wants to move like that again. God wants us to be a people that aren't going to put any limitations on God and tell God what he can do or can't do. Amen. Amen. So even though the vision is there, the people that receive that vision, they're now prophetic people. Say, I'm a prophetic person. Prophetic. Now God's calling you to be a prophetic person that's going to carry the word of the Lord in your mouth, that's going to bring that glory back. But you're going to have to go through a process. Amen. We're going to have to go through a purging and a cleansing and a purifying process. And when you get to verse 8 there, it says, And David... And all Israel played before God with all their might. You know, David was a worshiper. He wrote most of the Psalms. Amen. And with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals and trumpets. Wow. I mean, they were worshiping and singing. If you looked on the outward, you think this is fantastic. But see, God says you're going to have to go through the threshing floor. You're going to have to go through a process where I begin to separate what you're doing from your own ability from what I want to do by my spirit through you. Amen. Even though you got the vision, the vision has to die first. Because you can't do it in your own strength. God will always give you a calling and a vision that you cannot fulfill. I don't know if you heard what I said. God will always give you a calling and a vision that you yourself could never fulfill. Now that sounds like anxiety 101. What are you talking about? You're going to give us a calling, a vision that's going to be guaranteed to fail, that we can't do it, and God says back to us, yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you. That I'm going to give you a calling and a vision that you cannot fulfill in your own strength, in your own ability, in your own resources. You're going to have to learn the ways of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to learn what it means to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. To be emptied of self. To be dead to self. And that's what the threshing floor is all about. It seemed like everything was just fantastic. Everything's going great. Wow. Big mega churches. God bless them. Amen. All their big budgets and everything. And everything they have and everything is so beautiful. One person said, oh, we got a waterfall in our church. I said, well, I got a Holy Ghost waterfall in mine. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm just being. But you know what? We don't mind having a big church. Bring it on, Lord. We want it for his glory. But that's not where it's all at. And isn't it interesting that when they came to the threshing floor in verse 9 of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark for the oxen stumbled. Now here all of a sudden something went wrong. Everything was going great. You know, the, the big charismatic mega churches, they're on TV internationally. They're so famous, all these famous people and everything. And all of a sudden the virus hits. And people are shut down. Join us online. <laughs> I go, we go by these big churches. With a, and they're beautiful churches. And being a pastor, I'm like, wow, I would like a church like that. I get like that. I think, well, that would be nice for our congregation. And then nobody's there. Just a banner. Visit, worship with us online. No, thank you. I mean, if you're on live stream today, that's good. But, you know, you, the Bible says don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. As the manner of some is. But even more, we're to provoke one another to come together. We're to stir each other up to love and good works and to assemble together and come together. Even as we see the day of Christ approaching. And how many know it's approaching? And we've got to get together. 
And getting together is not going online. God bless you if you're online. But God wants to bless you more when you come here. So I'll lay hands on you. Hallelujah. Praise God for those that are saying, hey, we'll meet outside then. The Lord said in the last days, he told me in a dream, he said, it's going to be a church without walls. Amen. And I saw this church, we were in the south of France, and I saw this church, and I was with the pastor on a Sunday morning, and we were on a big green field, this Jean Paul, and, 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 and then the music team came over here, and then I saw a highway, like a freeway, in the, right there. It's like we were right next to it. And I said, well, where's the building? He goes, oh, we don't need one. Amen. We don't need one. It's over in Avignon. And, he, and I said, I said, well, we don't need one. He goes, oh, no, 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 we don't need one. And we start praising God and worshiping God out there. Amen. Maybe when it gets cooler, we'll go out here. Amen. Amen. And the Lord says, in the last days, it's going to be a church without walls. Because we want everyone to see what God is doing. I was, a, I was young during the Jesus People Movement. And the Jesus People Movement that happened there with Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapel, I'll tell you, Jesus was everywhere. Amen. Jesus got out of the box. Jesus got out of the buildings. I tell you, he was everywhere. You know, you couldn't wait to pick up a hitchhiker because you wanted to bring him to Christ. They would do that on purpose, on purpose. And then we would meet in restaurants with our Bibles open, have Bible studies and praising God. We go in the parks everywhere. We just have just, just spontaneous Bible studies everywhere. Everybody just did it. It was the way it was. I was like 13 at the time. And I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. Amen. Just to be out in the open. We need to do that. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, God says he wants that ark to come back, but he don't want to hide it. He wants to bring it out in the open. He wants to take that glory. He wants to take that veil off of it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When they came to that threshing floor, chided means to be crushed with a crushing blow. And it's with a sword or piercing like a javelin. So God's got to pierce. He's got to bring a crushing blow to us because there's such a hard shell over the wheat. The wheat has to be separated from the chaff, and that's not easy, amen? But that's what I believe is happening. God did, not, God did not bring this virus, amen, but He's using it. Because it's interesting to me to observe that it stopped a lot of big ministries. Just stopped them, just like that. And people are struggling and everything. Well, maybe God wants to get everybody's attention. Perhaps that's possible. That, uh, Amen. That's what happened here. The oxen stumbled. Everything was going great. And, and when you read that in the Hebrew, it means that the oxen got kind of lethargic and impatient. Yep. And they got restless and they started moving that ark around. They were carrying that ark and, and something made them stumble on that threshing floor. Mm. And the Bible says that, that, that they shook and the ark began to shake and begin to fall. And the Bible says that Uzzah, in verse 10, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him. Who? God did. Not the devil. It says God took him. I want you to catch that. It says he smote him. God did it. God took him. Took his life. God caused him to die in that threshing floor. Because he put his hand to the ark and there he died before God. And when you read in Numbers chapter 4, it says that the ark and the holy things are not to be touched. See, God says, he says, his glory he will not give. In Isaiah 42, 8, he says, my glory I will not give to another. Amen. We can't touch the glory. Someone say amen. amen. See, the problem is everything was so great, so much great success brings also great responsibility to give God all the glory. The more successful you are in Christ, the more God uses you, the more humble you must be. Amen. The danger is not failure, it's success. When everything's going good and you got a lot of money in the bank, then you don't pray as much. Everything is going great now. Everything's fine now. But see, I believe that this is a picture today of what's happening. We're in the threshing floor right now. Because God says, I don't like the way things are going. Things have got to change. People are doing things just because they got a lot of money. Amen. One church, people, one church congregation told me we got so much money, we just keep building buildings. They say, what a problem. This is the truth, I'm telling you. And they do. I've seen the campus. It's gigantic. And they go, we just have such a budget because they have so much rich people coming to their church. And they're just giving and giving. It's nice, right? Generosity. Father of generosity. Abinadab. The, the, the cart was taken out of the house of Abinadab. They carried the ark. You know, that father of generosity. It's good to be generous. Amen? Yeah. But I tell you, we have to have purpose. We have to know what it's all for. 
Just to build bigger, become more and more religious all the time. Just religion. Just getting religious. Just having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I tell you, it's so important that we have to go through that threshing floor where God purifies us and yeah. breaks us. That's where we're going to be broken. Amen. How many know that's where the wheat was broken? Amen. We don't like that brokenness, right? But that's exactly what happened. Because Uzzah is the word in Hebrew, and it's not a coincidence. None of these are coincidences, these names. Amen. Yeah, amen. Uzzah means strength. Isn't that something? The strength of the flesh tried to control what God was doing. The strength of the flesh tried to hold on. And that word hold on to the ark means tried to take control of it. Tried to take possession of it. Hey, things aren't going like it's supposed to be going. All of a sudden there's a panic. And then people start resorting to their own carnal ways of running the church, of doing things. And it's nothing more than just regular common sense, business sense. People you looking for this one and that one to support them when they're not waiting on God to do it. You know, business, you know, I'm not a businessman. Praise God. I want to be about my father's business. Maybe you're a good businessman. We could probably use you to help us with some things. But businesswoman here, we got some good business women as well. But I'll tell you what, I'm glad I'm not all savvy on business because so many ministers become businessmen and they're trying to build their church off of carnal business methods. Amen. We believe God can just bring that money in for the new building like that. We're not going to try to manipulate, coerce, try to do this and do that, try to get people to give. We want you to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes. So you get so drunk in the Spirit, you'll just give everything away. Come on, praise God. And you get so drunk in the Holy Ghost, you won't even know what you're doing. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Psalm 51, 17. It says that the sacrifices of God, that God accepts is a broken spirit. Because David said, what do you want me to do, God? I'll sacrifice anything. When he goes, I want you to have a broken spirit. Psalm 51, 17, a broken and a contrite heart, humble heart, you will not despise or reject. Amen. It's that brokenness over what? Over our sins. Yep. That's right. Brokenness over our evil yep. and what we've done wrong. See, there's been a mixture in this move, this charismatic movement, they call it. There's been a mixture in the churches. And God says, I want there to be a separation from the soul, from the spirit. That's where the baptism of the Holy Ghost comes to give us that power. Amen? Amen. Where God begins to give us His holiness. He begins to teach us the ways of His Spirit. Amen. The body of Christ has an epidemic going on. It's an epidemic of shallowness. It's an epidemic of spiritual ignorance. Of not knowing the Holy Spirit of God. I can sit here and, or stand here and preach every single day about the Spirit of God. And yet, if you don't encounter Him, it's just words going in one ear and out the other. You've got to know the presence of God for yourself. Because He's the Holy Spirit. That's why He said, you can't touch that holy ark. That's where my presence is. Any man would drop dead if they touched the holiness of God without the blood of Jesus. The only reason why we can have the Holy Spirit today is because Jesus shed his precious holy blood. And now we become the holy of holies. Your body is the temple, 1 Corinthians 3 says. 2 Corinthians 6 says. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And you look up the word temple, it's, it's really... Exciting to find out the word temple there doesn't just mean just the, the temple is a building. My, my body is a temple. No, it's saying the holy of holies lives in you. That's right. Your body is, is actually housing and carrying the holy of holies. Amen. Amen. Do you realize that? Do you realize you have the Holy Spirit in you? And he does not like unclean things and he does not like pride. He doesn't like arrogance. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, something happened to David. The Bible says David, he died there before God. Uzzah died before the ark. He died in the presence of God. Listen, that's where our flesh is going to die, right in the presence of God. Right when the Holy Ghost comes, no flesh is going to glory or boast in his presence. 1 Corinthians 1.26 says, no flesh will glory in my presence, the Lord says. So that's where the flesh dies. And it says before God, 
I hope you brought your Bible today. If you didn't, you need to bring a Bible. Amen. 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 We didn't use PowerPoint because this is the point, the sword. Hallelujah. Get the point. Turn to somebody. Get the point. It says he died there. That's where we die to our flesh. We die to our own ambition. We die to our rebellion. Come on. We die to our disobedience. We die to what we want. That's where we got to be crushed. We got to be broken over our sins. We got to have true repentance and say, I'm sorry. People say, oh, I'm sorry, and they go and do it again. That's not true repentance. Amen. Godly sorrow works repentance. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Not to be repented. And when you're really sorry, you don't go do it again. That's why we need the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. We need to get on our knees and pray. And don't get up from your knees until you have an anointing come on your life every single day. I said every day. We need to wait upon God until an anointing comes. You say, well, that might take a long time. It might. It might. When Brother Ron Perry told me, he said that his sister and his family used to pray for three days without even leaving their bedroom. Just pray for three days. Amen. Until the power of God, making the baby cry. Hallelujah. <laughs> the dog's barking. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. I didn't make the baby cry. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, God is going to do something that's going to shake everything. It says the oxen shook in that place. There's a shaking going on. How many know the whole nation got shook? Amen. That's right. Amen. Paul said, none of these things move me. Acts 20, 23. He says, none of these things move me. Neither do I count my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry that I've received of the Lord. And that's to testify of the grace of God. Acts 20, 23. I'll tell you what, nothing's going to move you when you are part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Everything that, it says in Hebrews 12, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. What does that mean? The things that aren't supposed to be in your life are going to be shaken. They're going to be moved out of the way. I'll tell you, when you're getting shook up, like Elvis, I'm all shook up. Uh -huh. Come on, your curl straightens out. Everything, you don't have a curl anymore. I'll tell you, when that starts happening to you, it's because God's purifying you. You say, well, I don't know. I don't feel good about myself. I don't feel good about my prayer life. I don't feel good about... Hey, God's bringing you out of your comfort zone. He's bringing you out of the lazy zone. Some people don't read their Bibles or pray at all. And then they come to church and they're all needing prayer all the time. We all need prayer. But I'm like, really? I mean, if you don't spend any time with God, you're not feeding your spirit. That's right. We can't really help you that much. That's true because we can't be there every day. Amen. Come on. And we love you, but we can't be there every day. But you got to discipline that flesh. You got to tell that flesh, I'm going to pray. Flesh, be quiet. Mind be quiet. Yes. Everything be quiet. Go get alone with God somewhere. Yes. Sometimes you got to get away from everybody. Yeah. Even, if you are, even if you are good at praying with your family, you've got to get away. If you pray with your husband and wife, that's great. You should be praying with your husband and wife. But you need to get away with God. That's right. That's right. You can say, hey, you know what? I, uh, excuse me. i got to go spend some time with God. That's the truth. you got to get alone. That Holy of Holies only had room for the high priest. You got to get alone so you get in that holy of holies, that place with God where God can get, begin to speak to you. Amen. How many want God to speak to you? Hey, is that a, is that a good idea? How many think that's a good idea? Amen. God wants to speak to you. So, well, he doesn't speak to me. That's because you're not waiting long enough for him to speak to you. He will talk. He has a voice. How many have heard him? Praise God. He says, my sheep know my voice. And when he says something like that, like he said to me the other night, I heard that. I know that scripture. But when he says it, you're like, yes, sir. When you, when you know it's the voice of God, how many know what I'm talking about? You never get used to it. Amen. I've been prophesying since I was 18, 19 years old, a few years back. And I'll tell you what. I'll tell them all my life, basically, but I never get used to it. I, I'm always just excited. I never want to talk about myself. I never want to say, oh, God used me and people were healed. and all. No, I'm just excited. I'm just, excuse me if I'm presenting it wrong in any way. I always wanted to get out of the way. But I'll tell you what, I'm still excited. I'm still excited when God shows me something that I know I didn't know. And it's true. <laughs> That's called supernatural. 
It's supernatural. Come on, praise God. I'll tell you. God wants you to be supernatural. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you feel shaking going on in your life, it's because you're on the threshing floor. Amen. God's purifying us. There's a deeper work of the cross where we've got to be circumcised. That flesh has got to be cut away. They circumcised the children of Israel a second time in Joshua 5, verse 2. They came out of the wilderness. They finally came to the promised land. But God says, now you've got to get circumcised again. Make sharp knives. Ouch. Mm. He told Joshua, make sharp knives of flint. Ooh. Mm. And circumcise the children of Israel again because they needed it. He says, these are the new generation. I tell you, there's a deeper circumcision of the flesh. God's got a remnant people with his mark on them, with his covenant mark on them. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Bible says in verse 11, and David was displeased because the Lord made a breach upon Uzzah. And that breach means like a tearing. It means there's a tearing. There's something going on where everything's just, it's like an explosion. It's like, it's like God burst upon him. And, and David was displeased. But it's interesting to see, first God was displeased. In verse 10, it says, The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah because he held, he touched the ark. But then it says in verse 11 that David was displeased. That's the same word. It's the same word in the Hebrew. God was angry and displeased. In verse 11, actually says in the Hebrew, David was angry and upset and displeased. God's going to get you upset with the things that he's upset with. You're going to begin to be displeased with the things God's displeased with. You're not going to be happy in the muck and the mire of sin. You're not going to be happy in greasy grace. You're not going to be happy living a carnal lifestyle and saying, I love Jesus, and then playing with the devil and playing with sin. You can't because God is displeased with that. And Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, they touch the holy things of God. They touch the Holy Spirit himself. And he said, you did not lie to men. You lied to God. And immediately Ananias dropped dead. Sounds like a similar thing here. Must have been in the threshing floor. And then three hours later, his wife came in and lied. Said, oh yeah, we gave all the money and they only gave part of the money. He said, why did you conspire with your husband to test the spirit of the Lord? The men that carried out your husband are going to carry you out too. And the Bible says, great fear came on all the churches that heard about this. It says that. It says that. Great fear of the devil. Great fear of the Jews persecuting them and killing them. No. The fear of God. The fear of God came. You see, when you begin to get angry with, with, with what God is angry about, you're going to start understanding the fear of the Lord. Because the Bible says in verse 12, and David was afraid of God that day. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, I thought David was a man of God's, uh, after God's own heart. Yeah, but he realized something's wrong here. We're doing something wrong here. He realized it when Uzzah died like that. He's like, wow, this is a holy God. You know, and this fear came on him. How many know the Bible says that in Psalm, in Proverbs 9:10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I'm here to tell you the fear of the Lord is being restored. Amen. The fear of the Lord that he's a holy God, that we can't play games with God. Amen. There's so many people playing games with God. And maybe you're one of them here today. It's listening to me. I'll tell you, you got to start getting the fear of the Lord if you want anything, if you want your life to be straightened out because if you keep playing back and forth, you're going to lose. God does not play ping pong. God does not play, come on. He doesn't play, God's not at Magic Mountain and on the roller coaster. Up one day and down the next. Woo! Roller coaster Christianity. Up, uh, vic victory this week. Next week you're all down in the dumps again, backsliding. You know, some people think backsliding is, is normal. They do. Some Christians think, and some people don't even know the difference because they're always backslidden. And some people backslide all the time. And they come back for prayer and they come up for prayer and stuff. I know who they are. I'm like, you know, you got to stop your backsliding. The Lord says he'll heal you. You can't keep going back. You can't keep going. Every time you go back, you're jeopardizing your life. The enemy can take you out like that. And God said, go ahead. God's a merciful God. He's long suffering, but he's not all suffering. He's long suffering. Come on, somebody. Say amen. The fear of the Lord's got to come back for the things of God in the house of the Lord and the things that God is doing. We have to have that fear. We have to have that reverence. We can't ever take the things of God for granted. And David said in the next verse, he said, how shall, in verse 12, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? It's like, man, I don't want to be next. I might be next. 
He's such a holy God. My home's not ready for this holy God. If he comes walking in there, he might dr I might be the next one on the floor. I'll tell you what, that's the fear of God. When we say, God, we got to clean up our house. We got to clean up our mind. We got to clean up our hearts. Because this is supposed to be his house. How can I bring him home to me? How can I bring him in this home? If I'm watching filthy things on TV, if I'm listening to filthy language. So the Bible also says in Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. How many know that scripture? The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. First time I heard that, I was 17 years old in a prophetic church. Prophetess lady became my spiritual mom. She got up with authority and said, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And I said, I need to hear this. <laughs> because I was already compromising here and there. My, I was a weak Christian. I wasn't living the fullness of Christ in my life because it wasn't even being preached. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. And I said, I need this. I need this strong preaching. I need some strong medicine here. I need to hear this because... God, if I really fear him, I'm going to hate evil like him. He hates evil. And when you read that whole scripture, he said pride and arrogance and talking bad talk. God hates it. God hates it. Come on. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Amen. You know that scripture. Amen. Psalm 1. So they don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. They don't stand in the way of sinners. They don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Those that are mocking and ridiculing. Amen. If you're in that kind of environment, maybe you can't help it. If it's your family environment, I don't know. But God wants to separate you unto Him. Amen. And you can walk in His holiness. Hallelujah. This is called the death of the vision. Every vision has to die. David thought, what's going on? I thought we were doing everything we're supposed to be doing. I thought everything was right. God says, no, it's not right. You're not doing it by my spirit. You're not doing it according to the due order. You're not doing it according to the anointing of God. You're doing it in your own strength, in your own flesh. So that flesh has got to die. That strength of the flesh has got to die. Come on. And that's where we're at. A lot of times we haven't been broken enough yet. We're still depending on ourselves too much. We're still doing things our way. And we want God to come along and take, we want to, we want to take God for a ride. God says, no, no, no. Give me back my church. Give me back my church. Let me take the driver's seat. Give me back my pulpit. Amen. Let me run the church the way I know how to run it. Amen. Jesus was given the Holy Ghost to give to us Amen. so that we could have the Holy Ghost become the head of the church and run the church according to those who are filled with the Holy Spirit, that we're moving together as a mighty army of prophetic people that are all connected because of one thing, that we're joined by the Holy Spirit, that we don't know anybody after the flesh anymore in the natural, but we see each other after the Spirit. We have that love for each other, not because we think you're a nice guy, nice woman, no, but because of who you are in Christ. We love what Christ is doing in your life. We can see the work of Christ in you, and that's that's what matters is that God says, I am working in you Amen. that which is pleasing in my sight. Amen. So that's why we have that fear and trembling. Philippians 2, 13. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's a fear and trembling, a shaking. There's a shaking. Why? Because it is God who is at work within you to will and to do his good pleasure. He'll give you the desire and the ability to perform it. Yes. And we have to see that we're all clay in the potter's hands. Amen, Amen. but God's going to kill everything of the flesh. Yes. He don't want nothing of ourselves. He wants us to be so emptied of ourselves that he can truly fill us. And last week I talked about how John the Baptist talked about and preached the threshing floor. You know, you know, he was the first Baptist, but he was the first Pentecostal. John the Baptist was the first Baptist, and he had the first Pentecostal message. He's the first one that said, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And he said, and his, his fan is in his hand, his winnowing fan. That's what you blow. And he says he's going to thoroughly purge his threshing floor. Wow. He's going to gather the wheat into the barn, but he's going to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Amen. That's the fire of God, by the way. You might think, well, maybe that's hell fire. No, I think it's, I think it's heaven fire. Amen. 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 So we don't have to have hell fire. We have heaven fire first. 
And he begins to burn up everything that's of the flesh. Why? Because to really, really be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says Jesus, Luke chapter 4, verse 1, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested of the devil. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't even know what that's like. And I'll tell you, it's a process. We don't get there overnight, but we got to die. In order for there to be resurrection life, there has to be a death first. Amen. How many know resurrection always raises dead things up? Amen. That means we got to die. Are you dead? Are you dead yet? Well, you got to die daily. Paul says, I die daily because every day that old flesh wants to come back. Every day there's something the devil wants to do to, to revive that flesh. Come on, somebody. Every day there's a temptation, a trial, a problem, a crisis we go through where the devil wants to try to bring back the things of the flesh and get us into the flesh. Amen. But I want to catch it. I want to get this through real quick here. There's the birth of the vision. Then there's the death of the vision. And if you've had that happen, I've got good news for you. There's a resurrection of the vision. The resurrection of the vision is actually found, and I want you to turn there with me, in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Because 1 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Chronicles actually quotes many of the same stories. You know that. This is the same exact account of what we read in 1 Chronicles chapter 13. And it's in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's the same exact story told a little bit differently. But there's something very interesting that I discovered in my studies that I believe is a word from the Lord. Because instead of saying in verse 6, they came to the threshing floor of Chidon, which means to be crushed. It means to be pierced. Amen. It means to be broken. No, this is a different name. And as I begin to study it out, even before I came here, the last couple of days studying on this, just wanted to see it again, even deeper from different scholars' perspective. They don't know the reason why the threshing floor's name was changed. But I believe it's because of a spiritual truth that God wanted to give His people. Amen. That He wants to show us that in that threshing floor, where it's like it's such a crushing, painful experience, it's also a place of preparation. Because it says here that when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died before God. And David was displeased because the Lord made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of that place Para Uzzah unto this day. That's where the flesh died that day. Amen. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall I bring the ark of God to me? But I want you to notice in verse six again that it didn't say chide in there. So that place where there's a death becomes a place of resurrection because naked means completely different in the Hebrew. It's a completely different definition. It means a prepared place, a place of preparation. Hallelujah. A place where God's getting you prepared. A place where God's getting you equipped. A place where God is getting you ready to do what He wants to do in your life. Hallelujah. 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 Well, say hallelujah. hallelujah. The threshing floor won't hurt as much. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You see, 1 Chronicles 15, 13, David said that we made a mistake. We didn't do it right. That's right. That's why there was a breach made upon us because we did not follow the due order. We didn't follow God's due order because only the priests are to shoulder the ark with the, with the staves, they're called. They're supposed to carry that ark. That speaks of the priesthood of praise. And only the priests are supposed to carry that ark. It wasn't supposed to put on this, on this uh, cart they had, this wagon they put it on. And he said, because we didn't do it right at the first, the Lord made a breach upon us. He made a tearing. That's why all these problems happen. That's why all these things happen. Because God had to stop everything. Because we weren't doing it according to the due order. Amen. And God's order is a place where God began. That word naked also means, you want to write this down, it means to be set up. It's a set up place, a place of preparation. But God's setting you up. Amen. I said, God's setting you up. Amen. I said, God's setting you up. 
for great things that he wants to do. Amen. So that place that was an upset becomes a set up. Hallelujah. Come on. Everything got upset. Everything got all oh, shook up. Yeah. Everything's falling apart. But in that very place, it becomes naked stretching floor now. It's a place where the Holy Spirit begins to fill you, where God begins to take your vessel and begins to burst within your life. Amen. His power in a new way. His love in a new way. You're going to start loving your enemies. Amen. You're going to have a new ability to forgive. Come on. Amen. You're going to have a new ability to let go of the past. Amen. Come on. God says you've got to let go of everything. Amen. Others have tried to take control. He tried to hold on. Turn and tell somebody you need to let go. Let go of everything. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Amen. It's a wonderful scripture. It says, My beloved brethren, be steadfast and unmovable. Amen. Abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know that your work in the Lord is not a waste of time. He says, Be ye steadfast and unmovable. That's where Nacon's threshing floor comes into play, where it became a place where God's crushing us, but so now He can establish us. Amen. Naked literally means in the Hebrew, it means to be established. It means to be fixed and stable and unmovable. I'm not making this up. Isn't that amazing? That God would show us the same threshing floor with a different name. Gives us a, a nice end. Amen. Gives us a very positive word out of it. How many want to hear positive things? God's going to make you what he wants you to be. He's conforming you to the image of his son. Hallelujah. Turn and tell somebody God's forming you into the image of Jesus. Amen. So that we all can come together. Amen? Amen. In the unity of the faith, the Bible says. Ephesians 4.12 says that God is equipping us. That he gives us a fivefold ministry. Amen. Yes. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Yes. Ephesians 4.11 for what? For the perfecting, the maturing, the equipping of the saints. Say, I'm in a place of equipping. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Through that brokenness, God's going to come. He's going to come forth. That sweet fragrance, amen, of the alabaster jar that's been broken. The oil is being released. As long as you're just looking at the jar, you can say, well, that's beautiful. A lot of churches become museums. They have nice, beautiful things. There, But God says, no, I don't want the church to be a museum where you just have nice, a nice alabaster jar. No, God wants to break it. God wants to open it. Come on. So that that sweet oil, this spirit can come out and benefit everybody in the room. Come on. God wants you to smell good. Hallelujah. Especially to him. Amen. David said in Psalm 52, 8, he said, I'm like a green olive tree in the house of the Lord. That means God's going to establish you. Amen. A green olive tree was the most, most priceless thing that Israel had. That was their commodity. That's how they made all their money from the olives. God says, I'm, I'm going to make you valuable. Come on, tell somebody, you're valuable. You're a green olive tree. And the green olive tree was very, very specific in the way it had to be taken care of. It had to be on an even, flat place. That means a balanced ministry. And it had to be by a water source. And it had to, be, it had to have constant oversight and cultivation. Yes. It's called the church. Amen. David said, I'm like a green olive tree in the house of the Lord. We used to sing that song. Amen. Amen. Say, I'm like a green olive tree Amen. in the house of the Lord. Because God is establishing me. Say it. And my roots are going down deep. It's not what's happening on the outside. It's what's happening beneath the ground. God is causing those roots to go down deeper. How many want to go deeper? Amen. Let's all stand. Give the Lord a hand.